Should the review here be different with respect to your due process claim and your equal protection claim? No. We submit that strict scrutiny is required in either case for different reasons. Due process, as I've explained, and the Supreme Court over and over again has affirmed, provides a fundamental constitutional right rooted in privacy, liberty, association, and so forth to engage in the institution of marriage. Not a false institution of marriage, not a something that is not citizenship but is called something else. It is a fundamental right of marriage which has all of the significance we learned here. Taking that away, that requires strict scrutiny. Because our fundamental rights can't be taken away unless the state has a very, very fundamental, strong, compelling reason to do so, and it acts with surgical precision so that it takes no more than the compelling reason justifies. In the equal protection context, we are talking about a group of individuals who meet every one of the standards for suspect classification. They are a minority. They have been. There wasn't any dispute about that. It's an immutable characteristic. The witnesses said that. The plaintiffs said that. The expert witnesses said that. The Ninth Circuit has said that in the Hernandez case. They have been victims of discrimination. They are classified according to that basis. There's been an issue, I will concede, that there has been some argument about whether or not they have sufficient, they have political power. But there has been a change, of course, because the, I will mention the Frontiero case, which is a sex discrimination case where there have been improvements. The legislature had enacted pieces of legislation protecting women from sexual discrimination. And the Supreme Court said that sort of proves what we're saying, that these individuals, because of their sex, have been discriminated against. And the legislature has recognized that by having to pass these laws to protect them from bad treatment, from harassment or whatever, there has been an increase in sensitivity in this state and in other places. But Professor Segura from Stanford said, I weigh all of these. And by the way, the political power issue is not a fundamental predicament, predicate, excuse me, for suspect classifications anyway. But I'm saying that he testified that, indeed, these individuals are lacking in political power to get their positions advanced and accepted by the population. And if we had to go no further than the Romer case, the Romer case starts with the language, we do not make in this country classifications among our citizens. And that is a classification that the Supreme Court dealt with based upon sexual orientation, and that is impermissible. But if you didn't have strict scrutiny, you would have discrimination on the basis of sex and sexual orientation. The individuals that are before you today do not have a choice for the person they wish to marry because the person is the wrong sex. They can choose anybody they want, except the states decided that it has to be a person of a certain sex. So their choice is foreclosed on the basis of sex. The sex of the person they wish to marry and sexual orientation, and the cases support a high level of scrutiny in that case. Your Honor pointed out at the conclusion of the summary judgment hearing, this issue is not about same-sex marriage. Just as in 1967, it wasn't about interracial marriage, it was the right in 1967, in the Loving case, the right to marry about, without limitation based on race. Here, the issue is the right to marry without a limitation based on sex. There's another reason why this requires heightened scrutiny. The evidence was overwhelming that this is a stigma. It's a government-imposed stigma. It's a government-imposed stigma placed in the Constitution of the State of California. What could be a stronger signal to other citizens and to other people that they are not okay? These people are not normal. If Proposition 8 is unconstitutional, where does that leave the domestic partnership laws? 
the way they were on the day before Proposition 8 was enacted. If, the, if people want to have a business partnership, they can enter into something called domestic partnership. Maybe lots of people don't want to get married, despite everything we've been saying about how wonderful it is. That is a choice. The Supreme Court has said. And Dr. Cott specifically said, not everybody wants to get married, but it is important. And she said it's, we don't even understand it if we can do it. It is the people that don't have the right that understand how harmful it is and how much it hurts. But if you wish to have a, the state of California can have all kinds of relationships between persons. As you heard on the stand from the plaintiffs and the witnesses, the expert witnesses, that's a business deal. No one aspires as a child, I, I think it was Dr. Meyer who said this, no one aspires as a child to grow up and enter into a domestic partnership. But they do aspire as children to grow up and get married. The other witnesses, the witnesses also told, uh, told us you don't have a celebration when you have a domestic partnership. You do have a celebration when you get married. It means there's so much that was said during the course of the trial about the meaning and significance of marriage. And the Supreme Court in Zablocki said that the right to marry is of fundamental importance to all individuals. It comes down to, just with respect, <coughs> excuse me, to the due process part, the, whether you are applying strict scrutiny, which is a very exhaustive examination of the objectives of the state, or heightened scrutiny, which is a very serious examination, and to meet the needs and to fix the, the state's interest versus what it's done to advance those interests, or whether it's called rational basis. On all of those bases, the, whatever the objectives of the proponents want, wanted to accomplish for the state of California, and we don't know because it keeps changing and it isn't being accomplished. The latest words from the proponents, counsel for the proponents is, we don't know. We don't know whether there is going to be any harm. And I would submit that We've always done it that way, and it's a traditional definition of marriage, which is something that we've always done it that way, is the same, is the corollary to the because I said so. It's not a reason. You can't have continued discrimination in public schools because you have always done it that way. You can't have continued discrimination between races on the basis of marriage because you have always done it that way. That line of reasoning would have prevented the loving marriage. It would have justified racially segregated schools and maintaining subordinate status for the married woman. We heard a great deal about that relationship from Dr. Cott. So the constitutional right to marry is fundamental. The cost constitutional right to be able to be in a relationship with a person of the same sex is a fundamental constitutional right. And in a sense, the state of California is burdening both of those, burdening in a very severe way that hurts individuals and doesn't do any good to prevent those persons from getting married because the evidence was also overwhelming in this regard. Heterosexual people are not going to stop getting married. They are not going to abandon their marriage, and they are not going to stop having children because their next-door neighbor has a marriage that's a person of the same sex. That is not going to happen. The evidence said that that wasn't going to happen. Although there was some talk about how the, it may have happened in the Netherlands, that evidence folded and disappeared before our eyes when he was cross-examined, Dr. Cott, I, I think it was Dr. Cott, or maybe it was Dr. Peplau, said that the four years before in Massachusetts and the four years after, the statistics were the same. Marriage, they're the same. Divorce is the same, and that sort of thing. And the statistics from the Netherlands didn't establish that pro proposition either. In fact, the evidence was 
that the so-called deinstitutionalization of marriage has been coming about to the extent that there's a weakening of the bonds of marriage in our society because of no-fault divorce and because of one, one of our expert witnesses said from 1970 to 1985, all over the world, marriage rates fell off. Divorce rates went up and things like that. Those were heterosexual people. That wasn't because of a same-sex marriage or a threat of a same-sex marriage or the danger of a same-sex marriage or someone being taught about a same-sex marriage. That was a false premise. So with respect to the Equal Protection Clause, I go back to the Yik Wo case where the Supreme Court said the right to the equal protection of the laws is the protection of equal laws. And in that case, this is in 1886, because of a Chinese person not being able to run a laundry in this city, the court stated that the very idea that a person would be denied a material right to, essential to the enjoyment of life, that's marriage, seems to be intolerable in any country where freedom prevails as being the very essence of slavery. Well, we know that taking away the right to marry was indeed the very essence of slavery. Yet that very freedom, once denied to slaves and denied to interracial couples, throughout this country is now being denied to the plaintiffs. Not because they're Chinese in this case, or not because of their race, but because of their sexual orientation. How can it be wrong in those areas and right in this area under the Equal Protection Clause? That does not square with any of the language that the Supreme Court has used in deciding equal protection cases. And that has been used, that same language has been used to strike down classes among citizens. That's the language of Romer. That principle has been extended from race to nationality, to ancestry, to sex, to legitimacy, to the favoring of the husband in matters of, matters of marital property, and in 1996, in the Romer case, to sexual orientation. So proposition to wrap this up, because I want to be sensitive to the time constraints. Proposition 8 discriminates on the basis of sex in the same way that the Virginia law struck down in Loving discriminated on the basis of race. They could marry whoever they want unless that person was the wrong race. The plaintiffs in this case can marry someone, whoever they want, except because of their sex or their sexual orientation. Sexual orientation, as I said, is the same. The sexual orientation discrimination is the same thing here as it was in Colorado. And the classification, we did it because we don't know. That's the reason. We don't know what's going to be the outcome. We did it because we don't know is the same as saying we don't know why we did it. Well, can't voters, you know, rely on their common everyday experience and impressions that they have as a New York court held, make a decision even if it doesn't withstand scientific scrutiny? Well, it depends upon the decision and it depends upon the scrutiny because every ordinary citizen, of course, has great responsibility in this country. But as Mr. Blankenhorn said, we would be closer to the American model, excuse me, the American ideal, if we eliminated this kind of discrimination. What, what is that voter common sense or ordinary citizen? I, I hate the term ordinary citizen because I think that every citizen is special. But yes, citizens can use their common sense. But what was their common sense in this case to take away the right of these individuals to marry? We don't know. I don't think I know as a result of this case that's gone on for a year and the evidence in this case. I don't believe it's because statements protect procreation among heterosexual persons or the institution of marriage that much of that procreation takes place in, a lot of it doesn't, but that's not what it is, because there is no evidence that one couple or one pair of individuals in this state or in this country will decide, I'm not getting married because those people are getting married. There is no evidence of that. 
And there is no evidence that there will be a dis diminished procreative instinct, God forbid, because people are allowed in the privacy of their homes to enter into an intimate relationship because they want a family like someone else. So if you have an analysis of the common sense of people, and even without all these experts, what were they thinking? I think the clearest evidence of that is protect our children from learning or being taught that gay marriage is okay, and that means that gay people's marriage is not okay, and that means that gay people are not okay. Now, if there is a reason for why Proposition 8 serves a legitimate, that's what it says, the court says we have got to inquire as to what the reason is. We have got to inquire, and we have got to inquire whether the enactment advances that reason. So what is the legitimate reason, and how does Proposition 8 advance it? I submit that we don't know what that reason is. Whatever that reason is, it can't be a post Do I have to find that it is a discriminatory motive? Pardon me? Do I have to find that it is a discriminatory motive on the part of the voters, that this is an effort to establish some private morality through the initiative process? Well, the Lawrence case talks about private morality and that as an improper basis, is it discriminatory? It has to be found that it's discrimin discriminatory. It says... Unlawfully discriminatory. Pardon me? Unlawfully discriminatory. Many discriminations are perfectly lawful and perfectly constitutional. That's right. And I am saying that, and I'm saying that it is irresponsible of the motives of a particular person in the voting booth. Nice people voted for Proposition 8, and people that didn't have nice motives voted in favor of Proposition 8. We heard all kinds of evidence during the course of the trial of some awful stuff that was being told to people about gay people. But I submit, and I'm willing to acknowledge that, I mean, there's plenty of good Californians that voted for Proposition 8 because they are uncomfortable with gay people. They are uncomfortable with gay people entering into marriage, and they are uncomfortable with the very idea that gay people are just like us. They didn't hear, and too bad they couldn't have seen the evidence in this trial of what the psychologist said, and the sociologist said, and the psychiatrist said about this as a characteristic between individuals that is normal, and it's acceptable, and it's not someone who is engaged in bad conduct. Now, you can have a religious view that this is not acceptable. You can have a religious view it was true in the Loving case. The argument was made that it's God's will that people of different races not be married. It's in the briefs and it was in the testimony in this trial that people honestly felt that it was wrong to mix the races, that it would dilute the value of the race and do all these terrible things. People honestly felt that way. But they were... They were permitted under the Constitution to think that, but they are not permitted under the Constitution to put that law, that view, into the law and to put that view into the Constitution of their state in order to discriminate against individuals. I think, Your Honor, <clears throat> that this law is discriminatory. The evidence is overwhelming that it imposes great social harm on individuals who are our equals. They are members of our society. They pay their taxes. They want to form a household. They want to raise their children in happiness and in the same way that their neighbors do. We are imposing great damage on them by the institution of the state of California saying they are different and they cannot have the happiness. They cannot have the privacy. They cannot have the liberty they cannot have the intimate association in the context of a marriage that the rest of our citizens do. We have demonstrated during this trial that that causes grave and permanent, irreparable, and totally unnecessary harm because we are withholding from them 
a part of the discrimination, excuse me, we are in withholding from them a part of the institution of marriage that we hold, one of the language of one of those Supreme Court decisions is on the point, intimacy to the point of being sacred. That right of marriage in the context of the intimate relationship. We are withheld holding that from them, hurting them, and we are doing no good. If we had a reason, a, a really good reason, for inflicting all of that harm, that might be another matter, but there is no reason that I heard. Preserving the institution of marriage. We've improved the institution of marriage when we allowed interracial couples to get married. We have improved the institution of marriage when we allowed women to be equal partners in the marital relationship. We have improved the institution of marriage when we didn't put artificial barriers based on race. And we will improve the institution of marriage and we will become more American, according to Mr. Blankenhorn, when we eliminate this terrible stigma. There are 14 Supreme Court decisions that talk about the right to marriage. There is the Romer case, and you know what that holds, and the Lawrence v. Texas case, and the testimony of all these expert witnesses, and the testimony of the plaintiffs. That erects an insurmountable barrier to the proponents of this proposition. It will not hurt Californians. It will benefit Californians. But as long as it doesn't hurt Californians to get rid of harmful stigma in their constitution that's labeling people into classes, then it's unconstitutional. Thank you, Your Honor. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Olson. City and County of San Francisco, Ms. Stewart. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, appreciate the opportunity, opportunity to address the court today, although Mr. Olson, like Mr. Boys, is a hard act to follow, but I will give it my best and very brief shot. Uh, I want to focus my comments on two questions that the court posed to the plaintiffs about the evidence that we presented that state and local governments benefit economically if same-sex couples are permitted to marry or stated otherwise, that denying same-sex couples the right to marry deprives the government of revenue and costs the government money. And question eight asks about the relevance of that data, that evidence. And I just want to start by acknowledging that the, <clears throat> that the fact that legislation costs the government money is neither necessary nor sufficient to prove a constitutional violation, but here the evidence of the cost to the government is relevant to whether Proposition 8 is rational or satisfies any other level of scrutiny. Here the costs to the government are uh, symptomatic of serious harms, many of which my colleague Mr. Olson referred to, that Proposition 8 visits on a segment of society. And the harms that gay men and lesbians suffer as a result of Proposition 8 are also visited on society as a whole because government and taxpayers in part pay for the costs of that discrimination. Now, I want to point to a Supreme Court case in which the court did consider the harms both to individuals and to society that were caused by legislation in evaluating the constitution constitution <clears throat> constitutionality of the law challenged. And that's the case of Plyer versus Doe in which the court struck down a, te a Texas statute that prevented undocumented children from attending public schools. And the court in that case stated, I'm going to quote, in determining the rationality of the statute, we may appropriately take into account its cost to the nation and to, and to the innocent children who are its victims. And the court in striking the law down in that case considered the following evidence. It considered, with respect to the children, the stigma of illiteracy that would mark them for the rest of their lives. It considered the toll that the legislation would take on their social, intellectual, economic, and psychological well-being, but it also considered on the side of society social science data showing how important the public schools are in inculcating fundamental values that are necessary to maintaining our democratic system. It also considered the fact that education provides basic tools by which individuals can be economically productive in their lives to the benefit of society as a whole. So like 
as in Plyer, the serious harms this Proposition 8 imposes on lesbians and gay men in their and their children, and on government and society at large, undercut the contention that Proposition 8 is rational. They also, I think, support the inference that Proposition 8 was born of animus because, as, as Romer teaches us, laws that can't be understood or explained by any kind of rational thinking give rise to an inference that they are based on prejudice. Now, I'd like to turn to the court's question seven and address evidence that supports a finding of permanent as opposed to merely transitory benefits to government of And add to that evidence in the record that established that the city and the county of San Francisco would suffer some unique injury, particularized injury, as opposed to the general injury that you might claim for the entire state. Yes, Your Honor. And I do think the evidence shows harms both to the state as a whole and local governments in particular. How about San Francisco? And San Francisco even more particularly. Why is that? Well, San Francisco in particular, I think, the one thing that stood out is that San Francisco, well, there are really two things, Your Honor. One is that San Francisco is a place where people of all sexual orientations come for tourist reasons, but often to enter into marriage. And so the city loses revenue because of the lack of the fewer number of couples who can marry. And that harm, I would say, is not transitory in the sense that it won't continue as long as Proposition 8 remains, although the witnesses, Dr. Badgett and Dr. Egan, testified that it would not remain at the sort of spiked level after a year or two. But people will continue to come to San Francisco to marry. Because it's a marriage destination. Because it's long been a city of love, the city where people leave their hearts. It's a, it's a factor of our culture in cool, San Francisco. Cool, gray city of love. <laughs> but <laughs> I would actually really, Your Honor, like to turn to some of the more serious harms to government because I think that that's the least of them, to be honest with you. I want to point to a few, and I won't have time to talk about all of them, but the first one that I wanted to mention to the court is that the cost of the the cost to the public health care system from having to diagnose and treat higher levels of mental health disorders that are induced by stigma from laws that treat lesbians and gay men differently. My colleague, Mr. Olson, referred to Dr. Meyer and actually played a clip of his testimony, and he talked about the stigma that laws like Proposition 8 imposed. He also testified about the higher incident of mental health disorders like anxiety and depression. And he particularly focused on the fact that lesbians and gay men, unlike other minorities, often suffer harm and prejudice at the hands of their own family members. And he talked about how youth in particular also are affected in a terrible way. They can't aspire to become married and have families when they're young and they realize that they are gay and as a consequence of the impact on them, the rates of suicide or suicide attempts are higher among lesbian and gay youth. Dr. Egan testified about the cost that those higher incidents of mental health disorders cost to the public health system. And he testified about some of the programs that San Francisco has developed to try to address specifically those kinds of stigmatic harms. But I think the most compelling testimony on that subject was the, was the testimony of Ryan Kendall, who showed two things. He talked about and showed the, how the impact of that kind of discrimination on him as an individual. And he also testified about some of the effects on society at large, some of the ways in which that harm to him caused the public to incur costs. And just to lay that out quickly, he testified that when his parents found out that he was gay, they were horrified, that they believed that being gay is a terrible thing and that they told him so, and they told him in pretty awful terms that they wished he had never been born, that they wished they had aborted him, that they would have rather had a child with a disability than a gay child, and that, would, that he would burn in hell, and et cetera. And they focused him to try to convert him, to, to try to convert himself as a 16-year-old child. He testified that he really didn't try to convert. He did. He testified that he didn't believe that he could, that he felt his being gay was as clear as his being a person of Latino descent. But he, he was affected dramatically, and he testified about the sense of loss of family and that he suffered. Let, let me ask, if the decision goes against the plaintiffs here, does the city and county of San Francisco have standing to pursue an appeal? Your Honor, we believe that we do, but I have never worried, quite frankly, that we would need that standing because I think the plaintiffs will most certainly appeal if we... Let, let's assume the plaintiffs decided not to appeal. Your Honor, I believe we do have standing, and I think that... I think we have standing in the same way that the cities of Boulder and Denver and I believe Aspen had in the Romer case. 
They were the plaintiffs in that case. Then presumably Imperial County would have standing, would it not? I think it's a little different. To, I mean, I'm not sure that Imperial County can come in here and show the court any harm that it suffers to its public health system by denying if they were if if they were to allow same sex couples to marry. So, I guess the court would have to address that issue more specifically. I think we've showed concrete harm. I think that you know. Then let's let's go back to the particularized injury or harm the city and county of San Francisco claims. Dr. Egan testified that our public health care system is a cost to the city of about $350 million a year, and that in his opinion, if cost the, of the public health care system, in other words, in total, in total, and the public health care system, as he testified, is the provider of last resort for many of San Francisco's residents, and that includes many gay and lesbian residents, and that if the stigma that is propounded by Proposition 8 were to be eliminated, if it were no longer embedded in our Constitution, that that would reduce the higher incidence of mental health disorder. That was backed up by the testimony of Dr. Meyer, who very carefully laid that out. Now, again, going back to Ryan Kendall, his example, while it wasn't in San Francisco, is somewhat what we face, and that is when he was being abused and was so horribly at a loss, he went to the Denver Department of Human Resources, or Department of Health and Human Ser Services, sorry, to their juvenile dependency system and sought, re sought their refuge there, basically became a ward of the state. So they removed him from the parents who were abusing him. He also relied on the public health care system for em emergency medical care. Why? Because he was 16, 17, 18 years old, couldn't hold a job, wasn't in school, didn't have the resources to cover his own medical care. He also testified that the stigmatic harm, he didn't call it that, but the way he felt, he thought he would kill himself if he didn't get help. So he went to get counseling from where? A public schools, a public institution's counseling services that, that were supported by government, local government, because he didn't, again, have the money to support himself. Those are examples of the kinds of costs that the public incurs because of, in, because of discrimination. I want to touch on a couple of other ones, Your Honor, um, and they include, and there was evidence of the uh, increased law enforcement costs that are required to investigate and prosecute hate crimes and other kinds of discrimination that, again, flow from the stigma and that society sends the message. <clears throat> and I want to start with Mayor Sanders, who testifies that. When city leadership talks in disparaging terms, and I'm using his words, or denies people rights that everyone else has, fundamental rights, then I think some people in the community feel empowered to take action in hate crimes and other ways. And Isn't the problem with that argument that a judicial decision, even a judicial decision by the Supreme Court of the United States wiping out Proposition 8 or similar laws wouldn't eliminate the kind of motives that could rise to harms that you've just described. These are going to exist anyway. They depend upon motives that the law really can't change. Well, actually, Your Honor, I don't know that, that it would end them altogether. I think that's a fair statement, Your Honor, but the testimony of Dr. Meyer and Dr. Herrick and of Mayor Sanders, who's been mayor and before that, and before that police chief, was that when you have structural stigma that's endorsed by the leadership of government and by laws, and particularly laws embedded in the Constitution, it does send the message, and the message translates into things like hate crimes. And we saw that in California. Hate, we saw that in California, hate crimes based on sexual orientation in the statistics we offered to the court in the state's reports is the second highest category and has been of hate crimes since 1995. There was also evidence about bullying and bullying in particular in California schools. And that fact, and the fact that over 200,000 incidents of such bullying based on sexual orientation occur year in, year out. And furthermore, that the state local school district like ours lose revenue from abs absenteeism because of bullying in a significant amount, that approximately 50,000 absences a year can be attributed to that. And the local school districts are, receive money based on attendance, and so they lose that. But the state also loses, and the, city lose, <clears throat> and the cities lose the productive work of the students who are not there, who engage in substance abuse and have other harms that are associated with bullying. Your Honor, I have a little time left, and I would be remiss if I did not make one more point and make it briefly, and that is this. The city, Your Honor, is acutely aware that when Professor Chauncey testified about the history of governments <clears throat> demonizing and criminalizing and persecuting gay people, he was talking about our city's history as well. 
And San Francisco once used its police power to harass and shame its own citizens and to force them into the closet and drive gay people and gay life underground. In knowing that, we as a city played a role in creating the stigma that continues to afflict, afflict our gay citizens and harm our whole community. San Francisco wants nothing more than to treat its citizens all equally. But Proposition 8 forces us instead to perpetuate the stigma we once helped create by again denying marriage to same-sex same couples and gay men and lesbians and sending the message that they are inferior. The evidence that we presented at trial and that plaintiffs, pre and that plaintiffs presented at trial demonstrates just how hurtful, how deeply hurtful and costly that is that message is, and how irrational and how invidious is the law, is the law forces San Francisco to send that message. So for that reason, we join in the plaintiff's request that the court hold Proposition 8 unconstitutional. Thank you, Your Honor. Very well, thank you, Ms. Stewart. Let me turn to counsel for the governor and the attorney general. Ah, the governor's counsel. <clears throat> <clears throat> Andy Stroud on behalf of the governor, your honor. The governor waives his right to make closing <laughs> argument and thanks your honor for his time. All right, I'm delighted you're here. <laughs> yes. Michelle Enan on behalf of the attorney general. The attorney general waives his time as well. Well, I have questions for, and I'm not sure whether it's directed to the governor, or the attorney general, or maybe the council representing the registrars, and that, that is, ah, uh, yes. Uh, uh, Claude Colm representing the Alameda County Clerk Recorder. All right, let me ask you. In Alameda County, when one goes in to apply for a domestic partnership, do you ask the parties to identify their genders? Um, I don't know for a fact, but I don't believe so, Your Honor. How about marriage licenses? I believe there may be a box uh, that has been reinstated on the marriage license now? We didn't check Alameda County, but just this morning checked San Francisco, Orange County, and Imperial County. It appears on applications for marriage licenses that in San Francisco, there is a box for groom, there's a box for bride, and that's labeled optional. And in Orange County, there is a bullet point for groom and a bullet point for bride and one labeled none. And I think the same is true in Orange County. And my understanding, although I didn't personally go through the exercise, in the Orange County application, which you can apply for a marriage license online, if you fill out, say, groom, and then fill out the data and then punch next, uh, which would call up an other party, you can put in groom again. It doesn't give you an error message. So what do I make of this? I suppose I can take judicial notice of all these things, can I not? I, I suppose so, Your Honor. I don't know what to make of it. I would presume that although you can apply for marriage with both applicants being of the same sex, that doesn't mean that the registrar will actually perform the marriage or will recognize the marriage. And it may be a way of sorting out applications for marriage that are not currently legal in California from those that would be legal. By that you mean what, sir? Marriages between the Alameda County clerk recorder was forced to deny applications for marriage from same sex. Including the plaintiffs here. Uh, yes, including the plaintiffs from same sex applicants after Proposition 8 passed. And how was the determination made that these individuals should not receive a license to marry? In the case of 
I suppose it may be on the application if we have an application similar to those. I, I, I believe there are actually state prescribed applications. Do they look similar? <laughs> no, they don't look similar at all. Then I'm mistaken. They may call for exactly the same information. Yes. But the forms are quite different in their appearance. Well, in, in um, one case that I'm familiar with, which is not the plaintiffs in this case, but some people came in and did a tape record or videotape their request for an application for marriage, and my client called me and asked me what to do. I don't think there was any question that they were of the same sex and that, in fact, they made clear that they were of the same sex and were applying after the effective date of Proposition 8. And your advice was not to issue the license, I gather? That is correct, Your Honor. We have said that we would follow whatever the holdings of the court are. We have taken oaths to uphold the laws and constitution of the United States and the state of California. So the determination whether or not this particular couple that is coming before registrar is, 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 a, a, is a couple of the same sex or a couple of opposite sex is simply made on the spot by whoever is at the desk at the time, I gather. I don't see much alternative, Your Honor. Would we ask for medical certification or? We have to take people at their word. If it turns out that there has been some deception, uh, there are provisions in the law for recognizing mistakes of fact. What's the situation if they were to lie? Say, say you were to have two people who appear to be men, and one said, I'm the groom, and the other said, I'm the bride. Well, I think in that case, um, I see two possible situations. One where the registrar would, uh, or the clerk would, it, it would not, it would not look to him as though they were of different sexes, and he might then have a discussion with them and ask them. I don't know whether we would take them at their word, um, because the marriage, I think, would be null, because it was, it was uh, based on misrepresentation of fact. Mm. No. What's the situation in a domestic partnership context in which an opposite-sex couple cannot become domestic partners unless one of them is older than age 62? That's for California. I believe in San Francisco they can at less than age 62. I thought that was a product of state law. Well, there is state law and there's San Francisco law. <laughs> well, I've heard of that. Uh, I, I know that, Your Honor, because I drafted the San Francisco ordinance. I beg your pardon? I said I know that, uh, Your Honor, because about 20 years ago I drafted the San Francisco ordinance, or co-drafted it. All right, I understood. Uh, but I do understand that under state law, am, am I correct in understanding that under state law that only opposite-sex couples can become domestic partners if one of them, uh, one of the individuals is older than age 62 or 62 or older? And that is my understanding, Your Honor. All right, so, so what do you do to enforce that limitation in Alameda County? I don't know that we get many cases like that. I suppose it's rather like somebody going into a bar, if you have your suspicion, you may ask for identification. I imagine the wedding ceremony that, that you performed, uh, that you referred to in the beginning of the trial, where I believe one member was 90 and the other was 85 or something such as that, had there been an age limitation of 62, I imagine 
you would have been at, you would not have been asking for evidence in that case. I don't, I don't think that was necessary in any event. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Well, we have come to lunchtime, and Mr. Cooper, you're up at one o'clock, and I look forward to hearing from you at that time. Let's adjourn until one o'clock. Does the clerk have an announcement? We would like to make an announcement. All right, the clerk wishes to make an announcement. Before you leave the courtroom, can you please stay and listen? If you intend to return to this courtroom, first of all, there is a second overflow that has been opened. So there is, if you intend to return to this at this afternoon, we suggest you leave a personal item to reserve the same seat. If you already have received a court-issued pass for the proceedings, you must use that pass to return to your designated courtroom. Now, non-pass holders seated in the main courtroom have been provided with an orange double ticket, which must be shown to resume a seat after lunch. All other non-pass holders seated in the overflow courtrooms must obtain a colored sticker before leaving for lunch. Court personnel will be at the overflow courtroom doors to provide the stickers before you exit the courtrooms. You must be seated before the afternoon session begins or your seat may be reassigned. Thank you. See you at 1 o'clock. Mr. Cooper, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor, and, and may it please the court. The New York Court of Appeals, Your Honor, observed in 2006 that until quite recently, it was accepted truth for almost everyone who ever lived in any society in which marriage existed that there could be marriages only between participants of different sex. Indeed, when the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court uh, made Massachusetts the first state to legalize same-sex marriage in 2004, it acknowledged that its ruling, and, and I'm quoting, changed the definition of marriage as it had been inherited from the common law and understood by many societies for centuries. The traditional definition of marriage has, likewise, uh, prevailed in California where, according to the California Supreme Court in the marriage cases, from the beginning of statehood, marriage has been understood to refer to the relationship of a man and a woman. So the first question, Your Honor, that has to be asked is, why has marriage been so universally defined by virtually all societies at all times in human history as an exclusively opposite sex institution? It is because marriage serves a societal purpose that it is equally ubiquitous. Indeed, a purpose that makes marriage in the often repeated formulation of the Supreme Court of the United States fundamental to the very existence and survival of the human race. The court said in Loving, it said in Zablocki and several other places, uh, Skinner, um, and the historical record leaves no doubt, Your Honor, none whatever, that the central purpose of marriage in virtually all societies and at all times has been to channel potentially procreative sexual relationships into enduring stable unions to increase the likelihood that any offspring will be raised by the man and the woman who brought them into the world. Mr. Olson quotes, as he did earlier uh, this morning, the Supreme Court's statement that marriage creates the most important relationship in life. That quote comes from the Maynard case, Maynard against Hill in 1888. And in the very same sentence, Your Honor, the court went on to say that marriage has more to do with the, the morals of a people than any other relation. Now, the court's specific holding in the Maynard case was that the contract clause of the Constitution does not apply to a state's regulation of the marriage contract because marriage alone, among virtually all conceptual relationships, 
in the court's words, partakes more of the character of an institution regulated and controlled by the public authority for the benefit of the community. And the Maynard K, uh, Court uh, explained why the institution of marriage is uniquely imbued with the, with the public interest. Do people get married to benefit the community? Uh, Your Honor. When one enters into a marriage, you don't say, oh, boy, I'm going to be able to benefit society by getting married. What you think of is I'm going to get a life partner. Y yes. Somebody Your that I can share my life with maybe have children, but all sorts of things come out of marriage. Uh, but but is you... the purpose of marriage for individuals to benefit society? Uh, from the standpoint of the state and the state's interests and society's interests, Your Honor, uh, and this is exactly what the Maynard case was saying and what many, many cases have said in addition, it is that this is uh, an institution imbued with social meaning and social policy and the interests of the community. That's why the state has an interest in it. It may well be that individuals who get married aren't doing it in order to benefit the community, although that is the ultimate result of it. But the question has to be, well, why does the government regulate their relationship, this relationship? Why is it different That's from a That's a good question. Why does the state regulate it? Why doesn't it leave it entirely up to private contract? Uh, Your Honor, again, because the marital relationship is fundamental to the existence and survival of the race. Without the marital relationship, Your Honor, society would come to an end. Uh, but beyond that, there are important societal values at stake. Irresponsible procreation, Why couldn't for the example, state simply say, look, marriage is entirely a matter of private contract. Uh, we're not going to issue licenses for marriage. We're, we're not going to set down a body of law that regulates rights and responsibilities of married people. We're simply going to say, you enter into a contract, and if you do, we will enforce those contracts if it comes to it, just like the state will enforce any other form of private contract. But why is it that marriage has such a large public role? What is the purpose? Your Honor, I, I think the state would go, uh, would do what you said, but the question becomes, um, why hasn't virtually any society done what you say? Why is it that in every state in this country and every country, insofar as I'm aware, in the world, indeed, regulate this relationship? It's because this relationship is crucial to the public interest. It's crucial to the public interest because, Your Honor, the, 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 the procreative sexual relations both is an enormous benefit to society, and it represents a very real threat to society's threat? interests. Yes, Your Honor, a, a threat uh, in the sense that uh, to whatever extent children are born into the world uh, without this stable, enduring marital union, raised and responsibly taken for the offspring by both of the parents that brought them into the world, then a host of very important and very negative social implications arise and uh, potential social consequences arise. <clears throat> Again, we know from all the authorities the purpose of marriage is to provide society's approval to the, that sexual relationship and to the actual production of children. As uh, Justice Stevens said in his dissenting opinion in the Bowers case, marriage is a license to cohabit and to produce legitimate children. But the state doesn't withhold the right to marriage to people who are unable to produce children of their own. That's true, Your Honor. It does not. It does are not you, insist. Are you suggesting the state should to fulfill its purpose of marriage <sighs> that you have described? No, sir, Your Honor. It is by no means a, 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 necessary, a, a necessary condition or a necessary requirement to fulfilling the state's interest in naturally 
uh, potentially procreative sexual relationships. Well, then, the state must have some interest wholly apart from procreation. It, it doesn't necessarily follow that that is true. It, it, it rationally furthers the state's interest to uh, extend uh, to attempt to channel into the marital union all potentially procreative relationships as well as all male-female relationships. It furthers the state's interests, uh, Your Honor, and it isn't a necessary requirement that the state actually insists that as a condition of marriage that uh, individuals who get married have children or be able to have children. And, Your Honor, Case after case has agreed that the simple fact that all societies in all states haven't required procreation of marital couples in no way eliminates the procreative purpose of marriage or doesn't detract from it. One of the most important reasons is how would a society that wanted to insist on pro procreation, uh, how would it... Uh, how would it go about administering such a requirement? Uh, well, the first thing it would have to do, presumably, and again, Your Honor, uh, on this case after case has made the point. The first thing it would have to do is to um, have some kind of premarital fertility testing. Presumably, it would have to have some kind of premarital pledge in which the couple found to be fertile in some intrusive process also pledged to actually have children. There uh, presumably would have to be some type of a post-marital requirement to enforce the actual begetting and raising of children. Because on what basis could a state, if it wanted to insist on procreation as a condition of the marriage contract. Uh, uh, on what basis could it require premaritally some type of a pledge to have children and some kind of proof of fertility and, and then not, um, and then allow people who uh, weren't having children to remain married? Presumably that there would have to be some kind of um, mandatory annulment process for marital couples who didn't actually fulfill their obligation to society to actually have children, Your Honor. Those kinds of Orwellian, Orwellian tactics. It is Orwellian, but isn't that the logic that flows from the premise that marriage is about procreation? If that is the premise for marriage, then the steps that you've just outlined would be reasonable, and rational steps from the state to take, would they not? Well, um, uh, the question is, um, w would they be required steps? Uh, in, in, a, in a state's regulation of the marital relationship, uh, regulation of procreative sexual relationships, irrational uh, unless it's, uh, it insists on procreation. And, Your Honor, uh, by no means is it. It, it. it is enough if the state or society seeks to accept to, uh, to attempt to ensure and to increase the likelihood that naturally procreative sexual relationships will take place in an enduring and stable family environment for the sake of raising the children so that essentially uh, the society itself, Your Honor, doesn't have to step in and take upon its own shoulders the obligations to help in the raising of those children. And so society doesn't uh, run the risk of all the negative social consequences that come from, um, say, um, uh, unwed mothers raising children by themselves and such if, as that. If the purpose of these marriage laws is regulation of the sexual conduct of the individuals involved, there are certainly far more narrow and tailored ways for the state to regulate those kinds of relationships. But instead, marriage regulation extends far beyond regulation of sexual conduct of the parties. There are 
support obligations. There are a host of other obligations that flow from a marriage that have nothing to do with the sexual conduct of the parties to the marriage. Well, Your Honor, uh, that is true, but a core element of that regulation goes to the procreative aspect and the expectation in the normal course that children will be born of a marriage and the relationships and rights that are, that are created within the context of that, of that procreative family. 